Okay, so thank you everyone for coming to today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section event. Uh, we have two uh, great speakers and uh, very exciting topics, so uh, uh, enjoy it. <clears throat> so uh, uh, before that, we have a few logistics to mention. This is our agenda today. Uh, so first, we are doing the introduction now. And the first, I apologize, our section chair, Dr. Chandra Shekhar Sowani. Uh, he has been kind of busy uh, these days for the Lunar Lander project. So he asked me to start the program. If we could not make it, if we show up later, we're asking to say a few words. Uh, so around 10, 10, 10, 15, uh, Dr. Garrett uh, will start the interstellar uh, talk. And around 11, 40, around that time, uh, uh, Mr. Lin Jensen will start this uh, uh, EA18G, uh, the Grounder talk. Uh, so, okay, so first of all, we welcome volunteers for AI all AIWA activities. You can contact me or our with the email address here. Uh, so our events are also posted in many places, including this link, aiwa-lalv.org slash events. Uh, AIWA membership program uh, 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 is posted on aiwa.org uh, slash membership. Uh, so uh, you are welcome to type your question in the Q&A box or click raise hand uh, more toward the end of the pre each presentation. Uh, it's better not to type in the chat room, but you know, it's reserved for communication, networking uh, with the speakers and uh, fellow attendees. But you know, if you really feel this, uh, the way you can type it there, but uh, hopefully speaker can catch your question. Uh, so if any issue like uh, disconnect, uh, disconnection from uh, Zoom, please keep trying. Uh, it's just temporary glitch, it should be fine. Uh, so Zoom has improved the security a lot, so don't worry too much. If it's really a problem, you can use the dial-in, uh, you know, to, to use the phone. Um, then this is just a few words for the Southern California, because we are blessed, as you can see from our two great speakers today. You know, we have people who are in JPL working on Mar uh, Mars uh, solar system exploration, including Mars Inside and Mars 2020 uh, Perseverance. Uh, we will well, be landing on Mars around February 2025. Uh, so then we have, uh, you know, Mr. Lin Jensen from Northrop Grumman. They do very exciting uh, Hornet, Super Hornet, our defense project. And also they were doing the uh, space telescope, like the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is going to be launched uh, sometime later next year. Uh, then we have Aerospace Corporation, SpaceX, are doing very exciting uh, planetary defense, asteroid exploration, space debris mitigation, and with company like SpaceX, Virgin Galactic doing space tourism. We have very exciting student uh, uh, branch and project. They're doing a very good job. Uh, so with uh, all these uh, cannot be possible, would not be possible with the, without the leadership of uh, great LA volunteers uh, led by, uh, for example, our advisor, Dr. Jeffrey Puchel uh, from Raytheon or Mr. Bob Frame from uh, Boeing Defense Space Security and, uh, and Marsha uh, Weisskopf from Aerospace Corporation and a, a, a group of uh, uh, you know, uh, dedicated volunteers, including Mr. Marty Waterman in Las Vegas. So uh, the Maryland from uh, uh, Cal State Dominicus Hills. Hills. And uh, once you join AWA, you know, you can you, uh, sh uh, chat with uh, fellow members, experts globally uh, through the Engage website, www.engage.org. Uh, so we're doing regularly every almost every Saturday except next week or holiday season uh, to keep people uh, networking each other. Uh, it's just a quick list of some coming up. Uh, professional society, you know, got a benefit, so please uh, look into it. And our headquarters is Washington, uh, yeah, uh, rest in Virginia. Our local headquarters is in uh, El Segundo. And uh, once you join AWA, you can enjoy a lot of benefit, networking, career, publication, uh, those things. So different level of membership. Educator is free for K-12 educator. And uh, some of the contact. And uh, actually, the e-member is no longer available. Uh, so, OK, so our first speaker, Dr. Henry uh, B. Garrett, is an AWA fellow, very high honor. And he's a principal scientist in the Office of Safety and Mission Success in JPL. Uh, he has a doctor degree from uh, in space physics and astronomy, and uh, he he was formerly from Air Force, and uh, he was has over 150 publications on the space environment and its effect with specific emphasis in the area of atmosphere physics, the low Earth ionosphere, 
radiation, micrometeors, space plasma environments, and effects on materials and systems in space. Uh, he actually gave us you know, short course as well. While on active duty in the Air Force, he served as a project scientist for the highly successful SCATHA program, which studied the effects of charging on spacecraft. Uh, he won the, uh, the distinguished uh, Harold Brown Award, the highest Air Force scientific award uh, for this. Now, in 1992, he was elected for a joint DOD NASA assignment at the Pentagon as part of a ballistic missile defense organization, where he acted as a deputy program manager for the Clementine Lunar Mission and the program manager for the Clementine Interstage Adapter Satellites, ISAS. For contribution to these missions, he was awarded again for NASA Medal Exceptional Engineering Achievement as a very high honor. And uh, after 30 years career in the US Air Force Reserve, he retired in 2002 as a full colonel and was awarded the uh, Air Force Legion of Merit. During his 40 years career at JPL, he has been responsible for defining the space environment and its effects and reliability for many NASA missions. He has also published several textbooks on the space environment and its impact on spacecraft design and the reliability. Dr. Gary is an international consultant on the terrestrial and the interplanetary space and spacecraft reliability, having worked for Intelsat, the Grady, uh, NASA, Loral, CNEST, and other organizations. In 2006, Dr. Gary received NASA's Exceptional Service Medal for his achievements in advancing the understanding of space environments in the effects. Recently, Dr. Garrett co-authored with Mr. Albert Willesey, uh, the primary NASA standard on spacecraft service and the internal charging for Earth missions. Dr. Garrett retired from full-time duties at JPL in 2017, but continues uh, in an emeritus position. He was made an Air Double Fellow in 2019. So it's our great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Henry Garrett. All right, let's give me the first few graphs. Let's see. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. That was that was more more than I expected on, <laughs> the, on describing my career. I'd like to start though with one plug, and that's for the science fairs. Um, my career started when in high school and back in the '60s when I built a telescope called the Schmidt Telescope and one at the International Science Fair. That, that's important because it turns out later after I went to work for JPL, I was assigned to the Hubble Recovery Project and based on my high school science project. I also and was the chief inspector. I followed people for Hubble for about two years and I had to certify the uh, correction. So you never know where science fair can lead. And I would encourage any of you to help with the local science fairs. I've been judge here for many years and I also was able to judge at the International Science Fair when it came to LA. I've also done when at Rice uh, where I went through undergraduate and graduate school, I also was a lightning chaser and that got me into uh, electrostatic discharge, which when I was in the Air Force led to my working on the SCATHA program, which was the first satellite to measure electrostatic discharge on orbit. As we'll see during the talk today, uh, spacecraft charging is one of the main uh, ways to destroy a spacecraft. Uh, I also have worked on many of the, the other JPL programs like Galileo, Cassini, Juno, Europa. And so I've been involved in a lot of those defining the environments. Uh, from 1992 to 1994, Pete Warden had me come back to the Pentagon when he was running the uh, Star Wars program for technology development. And we launched and flew the Clementine mission and its adapter satellite, which measured the environment between the moon and the earth, which I was in charge of. That satellite mapped the moon for the first time completely and tested about 20 to 24 different new technologies. So I've been involved in all aspects of this. I've been everything from a deputy project manager to having my own satellite to flying a lot of flying my own experiments. Now, can we have the next slide, please? This is, this is of course what you're interested in hearing about today is a background on interstellar flight and what the effects of the environment in space can have on your mission and how you have to, there's a lot of different things you have to consider for an interstellar flight than you would for a flight uh, in the solar system. So we're gonna go over the uh, why, why we'd like to fly, 
We could go for over the major reliability concerns and then cover some of the key issues. Then I have some references and uh, other uh, things at the end that might help you if you want to follow up on any of this. Can I have the next slide, please? This is a study I took part in about uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, you can see over there, 1999. Uh, this was one where we did at JPL, where we did a thousand astronomical unit mission, or TAU, as it was called. The idea is to place a satellite out at a thousand astronomical units where the sun focuses the light rays uh, gravitationally, and you can use it as a giant telescope. It also puts you out in the interstellar space, and you can make measurements out there, give you some of the other things. Uh, you get a large parallax you, from uh, the satellite out there to the back at the Earth. Uh, but you can think a thousand astronomical units doesn't sound like too much, but it's eight minutes in astronomical units, so that's 8,000 minutes to get a signal back and forth. That's quite a bit of time. Uh, Voyagers, of course, are at about 100, 200 astronomical units now, as we'll see. So some of the things you can do uh, is, like I said, do uh, parallax measurements. You can do uh, the gravitational lensing, and you can look back at the heliosphere of the Earth and map that out in three dimensions, which you can't quite do from the Earth. Can we have the next slide, please? Next slide. Thank you. Uh, this gives you an idea where we are relative to some of the local planets in the solar system. Basically, the one that's closest is the Centauri, Alpha Centauri system. And it's at about four to four and a half light years from us. That's where we'd like to go, uh, given that we want to do something in the person's lifetime. At two tenths the speed of light, obviously, it's going to take you about 20 years to get there. And uh, that's not quite the, a normal career, but at least you might be able to get some data. If you go to 10th, then it's 40 years and it's probably not much fun. <laughs> you, you launch something and you may never know how it turns out. So one of, the, one of the things we'll see throughout this study today is we'd like to do missions where you can actually do something in your lifetime. And we'll find out that that's a major issue is how do you keep alive a, a mission that its goal, its uh, products that it will provide may not come about till late in the mission, like after you basically retired. Can I have the next slide, please? There are a whole bunch of different ways to get there. And uh, none of them really, of course, have uh, come to total fruition yet, but we have been testing systems. Uh, we'll, uh, one of the ones that we have been doing is uh, like you call, think of it as exploding bombs. And we'll see in a second, you'll be surprised where that came from. It's a very old idea that basically you take a funnel and put uh, bombs behind it and you're on the front end of the funnel and you blow yourself into space. Some of the other ones are the traditional ones, the uh, uh, very high velocity escape from the solar system. Uh, Typically, you're looking at uh, velocities on the order of 40 to 70 kilometers per second uh, to get up there. And that, as you can imagine, as we'll see, takes forever to get anywhere. The other thing is the use of solar sails. I've done a lot of work on solar sails. The issue with solar sail is that, uh, in fact, I probably should take out one of my samples that I have here. What we've done is we use very, very thin tens of mils a thick, uh, as a mills a thousandth of an inch, by the way, uh, basically uh, mylar coated with aluminum. And the sunlight strikes this big flat sheet or round sheet, whichever you want, and pushes on it. And it provides a little bit of momentum that makes this the uh, satellite uh, and the solar sail accelerate slowly, but you build up speed with time. In fact, they, it, the claim in the analysis that we've shown is that you may get up to two, three tenths the speed of light by the time you get to Jupiter if you start at the sun with one of these solar sails. So although it appears to be feasible, we're only now beginning to investigate with the solar sails. And uh, we hope that uh, that technology will mature. We've built several on the order of 40 meters or larger. As you know, the uh, Planetary Society launched one recently that's been fairly successful. And I think that that's a very good way to go. Then of course, there's electric propulsion. Electric propulsion, of course, though you have to carry your fuel with you, or if you follow up on some of Dr. Ford's uh, recommendations, you can 
you can lay out a strain of uh, fuel in front of you from pre previous methods and grab the fuel as you go. <laughs> but the bottom line is that you have to have a fuel. Uh, you can also grab it from interstellar space. That's down here on the lower right. The Bassard interstellar ramjet is one possibility. Though I think there's some problems that they found recently with that system working. But the bottom line is you can gather in hydrogen, um, take it, basically burn it as a, either electric propulsion or in some form of um, fusion to use it. And then there's the beamed power, and that seems to be the popular one right now. The, the Starshot Breakthrough uh, Organization is looking into using solar sails coupled with a uh, huge laser beam that you basically focus on the solar sail to get it up to uh, two tenths the speed of light as it leaves the solar system. And finally, there's the, the some, like I already mentioned, the Broussard drive. There's some uh, more exotic ones, uh, matter, antimatter, and the fusion drives. All of these are sources that can perhaps get you up to at least a tenth to two tenths the speed of light uh, as you leave the solar system. Obviously, though, on these, uh, many of them, like the solar sails in particular, you have to have a hard time slowing down as you go by the solar system. Uh, at the extra, so, extraterrestrial solar system. So most of these will be flyby missions rather than trying to stop. Though you can, there are ways even with the solar sails to uh, that Ford, uh, Professor Ford came up with uh, slowing down and stopping at the, sol at the other solar system. So these are the ways we might get there. And I'd li like to show you one and I have a little surprise here. Can we have the next slide, please? Next slide. Oops, there we go. Uh, I grew up in a small town in New Mexico called Roswell, New Mexico. And as a child, um, I would, uh, me, my mentors were people that actually worked with Robert H. Goddard. Uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen that was my main advisors is for the science fair and everything. He actually rode a pony out and spotted the satellites, I mean, the rocket launches for the Goddards. They have a beautiful museum in Roswell, and it's not the UFO museum. I want to stress, it's not the UFO museum called the Goddard Museum. If you're ever in Roswell, don't go to the UFO museum, go to the Goddard Museum. They have his actual laboratory there. They have 10, 20 of his rockets. They have uh, pictures of all the launches. They have his books and stuff. It's an incredible experience because it turns out that Roswell was actually probably the first spaceport in the, United, in the world. And given all the launches back in the 20s and 30s that he did there. So I would again, highly recommend going to Roswell. And yes, I'm a son of Roswell and I was born uh, night, February the 15th, 1948. You can do the math on the UFO landing if you want. Uh, but the bottom line is the idea was that you take a funnel, you can see it there in, in the middle and we put tea in there and cause pulses. And he holds the patent on that. And back in the uh, 1960s, NASA reinvestigated that uh, process with Project Orion and they actually developed a system that would work. The problem is that it tends to want to use atomic bombs. And as you can imagine, there are some issues with, uh, with issues with the uh, use of atomic bombs in the atmosphere, as you might suspect, or even in the Earth's environment. So for now, that, pro that process is on hold. But in principle, it would work. Just throw atomic bombs out the back with a shield between you and them, and, and that's the propulsion. So, in principle, it's possible to go into interstellar space and approach uh, speed of light. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, can, can we do it? We're already doing it. We already, as you know, Voyager, the pioneers, and now the New Horizons are actually out there approaching uh, out in interstellar space and then eventually will approach stars. You can see down here on the table, it's gonna take a little while. Uh, Pioneer 10 will take 32,000 years. Uh, the Voyager 1 will take 40,000 years. Uh, Voyager 2 probably won't make it there in, in, in our lifetime. That's a half a million light years. Uh, so, I mean, years to get there. So anyway, there are interstellar missions and they're on the way. 
And right now the Voyager is still operating. On the right are some data from the Voyager mission compared with a, a long-term satellite called IMP-8 that worked about 30 or about 40 years in uh, solar orbit near the Earth. And you can see as they start out back in 1980, the uh, data from the Voyagers and the IMP-8 uh, agreed quite well. As time goes on, of course, they start to deviate. And you can see that the, uh, the variations uh, start to vary, but now we're actually out in the heliosphere with the uh, Voyager spacecraft and we're making measurements of that environment for the first time. So can we go to the next slide, please? So yes, we can do it. We're doing it now, as I say. And you can see where they are now. This is a chart that's updated every few months by Chris Pete. Uh, heavens Above website there if you want to go to it. And it shows you where each one of the missions are at the current time. And you can see right now, the farthest out is Voyager 1 and uh, where, where it stands right now. I'm getting a lot of the messages. Let me see if there are any I can respond to while we're talking. Uh, nope, I don't see any questions that we need to answer right now. Right, the issue is, what is out there? Where we are located right now at one astronomical unit from the sun is well inside the Earth's, the, inside the sun's heliosphere. And on the left, you can see some uh, schematic versions of what we think it looks like. Uh, right now, one of the main ideas is it's sort of a, a lopsided uh, sphere. And we run in that sphere of plasma runs into the plasma in interstellar space. And as a result, you get the, the structure down at the lower left. Uh, you can see the direction that the Voyagers are moving and where they're coming out into that medium. And we think that we've just about cleared it with Voyager 2. Voyager 1 seems to be already well out into it. And interestingly, they do have fairly different measurements. So there's some, some lack of clarity on exactly what the heliopause, as it's called, looks like. So you basically, we live inside the heliosphere. That's around that heliosphere is a region called the heliopause. And outside that, we get into interstellar space. And for the first time, we're actually making measurements out there for on the, the, that environment. So let's go to the next slide, please. Here are some of the many different types of environmental concerns that we need to take into consideration. We're gonna be talking about environmental exposure today primarily, but obviously propulsion systems, each of those has its own problems. <coughs> Clearly nuclear bombs and nuclear fusion and things of that nature give off gamma rays, high energy, other types of high energy particles that basically will irradiate whatever system is near them. And so shielding, and radiation tolerance are gonna to be major problems for those. Likewise, the electronic systems themselves are very sensitive to radiation. And we'll look at some of the, the levels that we're going to expect uh, the, for the systems to see and discuss some of the techniques that we can use to protect the electronics. Mechanical systems probably think wouldn't have a problem, but remember the things like optics, uh, glass. Glass, for example, can become radioactive with time, exposure to the radiation environment in space, and it becomes darkened. And as we'll see, you can damage and darken materials and destroy their tensile strength. And so materials become a, a major issue. Likewise, thermal control. Uh, space is very cold, obviously. And one of the things you have to do, typically, if you want your system to work, is you're going to have to provide some kind of heat sources. As of right now, we typically use RHUs, radioactive heating units, little bitty pellets that we put next to things that want to be warm with plutonium in them that try and keep them warm. But again, plutonium has a, has a fairly short half-life compared to like a 20-year to 40-year mission to interstellar space. Then probably one of the more important things is infrastructure. How do you keep up the infrastructure like the deep space network? for 40 or 50 years that you need to uh, listen to the signals coming back from our spacecraft? And how do you keep up the people that know how to interpret the data or even are interested in interpreting the data? I'm in the mission assurance area and mission assurance uh, is a continuing process throughout the mission. 
I don't think there's any JPL mission that we've flown that we haven't had some uh, flaw or something happen, uh, some software error, some uh, hardware problem like the antenna not opening, uh, computer resets, things of that nature, that we have to constantly have mission insurance going on to keep the spacecraft active and running on time and properly. And like, for example, with New Horizons, I understand that they had a fault uh, a few days before the encounter with Pluto and they went into overdrive and were able to restore the satellite in time to get the beautiful pictures that we've seen. And then, then we come to software. I lost a satellite because of a software glitch that we had on board. Uh, the Clementine satellite was in orbit around the moon and getting ready to go off to an asteroid. And uh, we fed the data, the launch data in for it to uh, leave lunar orbit. And there was a glitch in the program that did that. One of the lines of code was wrong. And it, it was three axis stabilized spacecraft. And unfortunately, the thrusters turned on to aim it in the right direction and never turned off. That was the code error and thing went into a permanent spin and went off into space. Unfortunately, we don't have an off switch. And so about every five or six years, the satellite turns back in the sun and starts dumping data. And so we used to get it, but now we're not. But that can happen. You can have rogue satellites out there going forever because of software problems. The other thing is we need to have integrated systems health management. The spacecraft itself is going to have to be able to autonomously control itself, make corrections, uh, do things of nature of rewrite the software if it has to. And finally, navigation attitude control. That's going to be a particular issue for these beam riders to keep them so that they're, aim, they're aiming right at the Earth. Also for any signal that comes from the uh, satellites back to Earth, we're going to make sure that they can aim properly at the Earth and keep their antennas uh, looking back at us. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, I've taken part in a number of these types of studies where we look at what are the major causes of failures on spacecraft. This is a representative one. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the studies uh, tend to be uh, classified nature because of the uh, satellite systems involved. But this gives you a uh, nice view that's pretty much consistent with everything we know of the types of errors that we have that cause spacecraft to fail. You can see by far the largest ones are design flaws, uh, followed by uh, unknown and environments. And a lot of the unknown ones typically are environmental is what we believe. But environments certainly are at least 20% of the causes. Down there, some of the other things are parts. You have bad parts on a spacecraft and after so many months or years, they just plain wear out and fail like a, like a light bulb burning out. Quality assurance, uh, we have a problem. For example, people have uh, given us uh, imperfect materials uh, like metals, uh, the wrong type of tit uh, titanium was polluted with some things on one of our satellites. Uh, they caught it fortunately before launch. And so the you have to make sure that the quality of the materials that you get and the quality of the parts are up to snuff because people, unfortunately, people are people. And we actually have people who have bad parts, they have more money that way. And so quality assurance turns out to be a major uh, uh, problem that we have to take constant uh, awareness of. Then there are operator failures. We've had people turn the antenna the wrong way on Mars and we lost one of the Vikings. And after 10 years, I think of operations, one day the new fellow accidentally just aimed it, hit the command to aim it somewhere else and we never got it back. So operator failures are also uh, issue that we have to concern ourselves with. And then of course, there are all the other types of things. Um, as we'll see in a minute, meteor meteoroids hitting you, uh, electrostatic discharge, radiation damage, false commands. Uh, we've even had uh, commands on the ground uh, from a, another antenna system uh, turn on the satellite while it was still on the launch pad and uh, caused some irreparable damage, things like that. So there's many, many ways spacecraft, as you can imagine, and their launch vehicles can fail. And anyway, this gives you some feel for the uh, types of failures that we're going to talk about today. Can I have the next one, please? Next slide. 
Here's some examples. I don't know if on the left one there on the single event upset, so hopefully you can see it on your screen, but it looks like a black field. And if you look very carefully, there are thousands of little dots, and then you can see some streaks in there. This is perhaps one of the major problems we're gonna to have to worry about for our interstellar probes. This is the background cosmic rays. In this particular case, it's for Hubble and uh, the, one of the Hubble chips, when the lid is closed on the Hubble, this is what you see inside. And indeed, this is when we pass through what's called the South Atlantic anomaly, where there are a lot of protons. But you get the same effect from solar proton events and in the galactic cosmic rays. Each one of those little dots is where a high energy ion passed through one of the pixels and caused it to flip. Uh, the streaks are where the particle came in at an angle. So I want you to think of this as a computer memory chip because that's exactly what CCDs were originally thought to, to be. Uh, they were gonna try to use them for memory chips. And think of this as your memory for your computer and you're constantly having the bits flipped by cosmic rays coming through your system. And sometimes, as you can see over there, the cosmic ray comes in and knocks out multiple chips all at the same time. This leads us to real problems in uh, computer storage and uh, operations. And you can imagine over a 20 year mission, it, particularly if you have uh, a hard wired memory on your thing, it could be, some of it could be seriously damaged. Now, usually what we do is uh, this, the, um, uh, memory element, one of the first basic things you do is you randomize the location of the bits. Therefore, when one particle comes through, it's not going to take out your entire word. The other thing that you do is you make uh, record the, uh, the bits, a, a two sets of the same measurement so that you have the signal twice recorded and then you compare those or you can have a third one. Actually, sometimes we do three uh, triply redundant memory, and then we compare the three uh, uh, bits of information before we send them back to find out uh, where the differences are. But this is a major problem, uh, single event upsets. As we'll also see, you see those little streaks on there? When that passes through your electronic circuit, that's up on the left there, up right above the single events. Um, Ken, you might point to a couple of them on the left there if you can if you can get to them. Um, yeah, a little more, 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 a little, you're almost there, there's one. And you can see those streaks. Um, that's a track, that's an ionized track through an electronic device. And believe it or not, that can operate like a wire. And that wire can short out the device. We call that latch up. That's the greatest fear that we have for microelectronics in space. Before you can turn the device off, if you're not careful, it can melt. And so what we have to do is we have to put what are called watchdog circuits in. We have to do, we, we check our parts very carefully to make sure they don't latch up to try to minimize the, even the probability of this. This is the scariest problem that we have is that you can actually have a cosmic ray cause a, a sneak circuit and melt out the thing. At the bottom is the area that I typically work in, and that's called spacecraft charging. Uh, there are two things that happen there. Basically, if you immerse any spacecraft in the plasma, it builds up a charge on its surfaces. At just synchronous orbit for the Earth, you can build up potentials as high as 20 kilovolts between two adjacent surfaces. So when we find that you can, at 100 volts, actually throw an arc. And uh, there's evidence that our satellites are constantly have this low level buzz of little arc discharges on their surfaces. Uh, some satellites uh, have actually been observed using the Arecibo and some other system to have uh, what people claim are continuous arcing, little low level arcs like St. Elmo's fire or glow on the satellite. So surface charging is a potential issue. Uh, more the, turns out to be the major cause of satellite damage of all the things I've talked about here, uh, at least at Earth, is in what's called IESD, internal electrostatic discharge. What happens there is uh, particles coming in, uh, electrons and protons coming in with the same energy, the electrons typically will penetrate uh, much farther into the vehicle. And we usually use about a um, hundredth of, hundredth of an, uh, see, tenth of an inch, 100 mils of shielding on most spacecraft. And uh, right below that, if you use 40 mils or less, it turns out that these particles can penetrate 
into the circuit boards and you can build up charge on the circuit boards or you can build up charge on the uh, little metal um, filaments that you have on it. People have put their name uh, in metal on the circuit boards inside a spacecraft and the letters, the, the, the arcs have curved between the letters and then into the circuitry. And then the circuit boards themselves are dielectric and they can build up charge. We also find and um, I uh, that the blocks of plastic, I usually show a movie at this point, but I was afraid to do it because I wasn't sure how it work out. But um, look up Lichtenberg patterns. Uh, we find that sheets of glass or plastic or even, and typically cabling is the big problem with a heavy insulation. Insulation can build up charge over time in space, electric, negative electrons inside them, and they can arc and actually uh, blow out systems. We had that happen on 42 times on Voyager 1 as it went through the Jovian radiation belts. And those each time there was an arc that fed into the computer system and the science computer on Voyager 1 was reset 42 times every time it discharged. And slowly but surely the, the pictures on Voyager 1, if you look, drift out of the field of view because the timer on the one computer versus the main spacecraft computer shifted. So the spacecraft was aiming at a different, at, a, at the right spot, but the science computer wasn't taking the picture. And that was all because of this IESD problem. And as you'll see in a moment, we've lost a number of satellites due to IESD. In fact, it's the main kill me mechanism. Interstellar space, fortunately, uh, though I can't promise this, the uh, environment is, is not as heavy in high energetic electrons. And so we not, there is a bleed off path typically for most materials. And so with time, we would hope, at least in interstellar space, IESD is not going to be a major problem. Surface charging, still not clear. I believe it probably won't be a problem. But on the right there, those are the things that we're really afraid of. The upper right picture, if you look at it, notice it says 100 with a little line over it, NASA, that's 100 microns. That's the scale size of that. That's a little micrometeoroid that hit a thin surface on a NASA satellite. And then that particle was busted up. And if you go down to the next slide to the left, that's a thousand angstroms. So that's a 10 times magnification of uh, microns. I'm sorry, 10, a thousand micron is the scale there. Uh, that's a thousand times uh, bigger uh, than the, uh, I'm sorry, 10 times bigger than the other picture. So you have a little particle hit the first shell, it blows apart into thousands of fragments and you get the shotgun effect. That's called a Whipple shield. And why is that an advantage? Well, the advantage is that by breaking up the particle, uh, it, the little particles don't do quite as much damage in one spot. You're, so you're trying to get, instead of having one whole wall the way through you, you have lots of little bitty particles that uh, break apart and uh, are fractured and don't penetrate the second shield. This is where they protect tanks, for example, is this two layer shielding. The only problem with this, if you look carefully at the second figure, is if you build two redundant circuits next to each other, you're gonna take them both out. So one of the rules of thumb is if you're trying to protect from micrometeoroids is you spread, you do your redundant circuits in different places so that you don't get this type of shotgun effect from the particle going through. But the bottom line is micrometeoroids are just ubiquitous in space. And nowadays the three problem. I, as I said before, I worked on Hubble and when they brought the Hubble camera back, I crawled all over our, our wide field planetary camera surface and there were over 600 after about five to, I think it was five, six years in space, 600 pits in about a two meter by meter area, little bitty ones. I want you to know these are very tiny, but some of them are fairly large. They basically chip the paint off. They put little holes in and punctures like what you're seeing on the, the right there. So space debris, micrometeoroids, at least in earth environment are an extreme problem. And in space, in interstellar space, it's going to be one of the main issues because look, you're gonna be in there for at least 20 to 40 years and you're gonna be going through what's not an empty volume as we'll see in a, in a couple of view graphs. So to summarize, we, we're going to look at radiation effects. We're going to look at dose next. 
after and the spacecraft charging and with micrometeoroids and space debris. Can I have the next slide, please? This is an old, this is an old chart. Uh, it's pretty much representative of what's still going on though. But uh, this is by Harry Coons at Aerospace Corporation, where what he did was he listed for all the missions that they had on record, what the major causes of failure for them were. Uh, on the left, you can see is the distribution of anomalies. Now, a lot of these anomalies did not lead to satellite failure. On the right is a list of missions that were lost or terminated due to space environments, and including one where the uh, space, two spacecraft, a Russian and I think it was Iridium, ran into each other and uh, caused a huge explosion, destroying both satellites. So satellites running into satellites. But on the left, you can see uh, electrostatic discharge, internal charging is by far the worst uh, killer of spacecraft of all the different anomalies that we see on spacecraft. Then after that surface charging, and then as you move down, you get into the cosmic rays and the solar particle events. And South Atlantic anomaly is the region at the earth where the protons are much more intense and uh, because of distortions in the magnetic field. And those SEU stands for single event upset, as I talked about before. Again, a high energy particle passes through a, a, a junction on a computer memory element and flips it uh, from, positive, from on to off or back and forth. And in fact, uh, I, if I remember properly, the Planetary Society's uh, first satellite was turned on and, and promptly went, the computer went off and because of an SEU. And then a few days later, it got hit by another SEU and turned back on. We found, for example, that PCs, the early PCs in space, when the astronauts were using them, get hit by a cosmic ray and go into self-check mode. And so you really don't know what's happening when you get these little single event upsets. One of my favorite ones is they can, you can hit, hit the computer with a, a cosmic ray and it locks up or it goes into self check mode or worse yet it sends, if it's on a spacecraft, it can send out a command like fire the thrusters. We've actually had that happen, as I said before, um, they, uh, with satellites actually turning on when they weren't supposed to because of the uh, cosmic rays. And down here, you can see some of the other types of failure, solar array, solar proton damage, material damage, and then you get down into micrometeoroids and you can see all the different things. But this gives you a feel for all the different ways your satellite can screw up. And I want you to think about that and when you think about a 20 to 40 year mission. Voyagers is quite phenomenal uh, that they've managed to work through all the different problems that they've had. And they've had some doozies on them. As I said about Voyager 1 going by Jupiter and the radiation damage. If I, under, if I remember properly, when the Voyagers first turned on, their computers were sophisticated enough that they wanted to know where they were. And they didn't know where they were. And it took them a day or two uh, for with ground, working with ground control to get the antenna off, aimed right and to get them to agree with the ground that they knew where they were. And so you have these smart computers and the smart computers can argue with themselves and with you and you have to be very careful. So on the right there, you can see the, some of the satellites that have been lost, permanently lost. And uh, a, a number of, uh, in fact, most satellites usually die uh, just sort of fade away because they lose fuel or because their solar rays lose power. So can we notice, go to the next slide? Back, 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 there. Um, there's, these are some of the ways that you can do long-term damage to something in space. On the left is from, uh, from my SCATHA satellite that I was a project scientist for. You can see the solar absorption. That is the uh, way it absorbs heat. It's usually the ratio e, e over epsilon over alpha, alpha over epsilon is called, and it's how much is reflected versus how much is absorbed. And you can see that that changed dramatically with time. And you're balancing the initial design of the spacecraft is over there on the left, about 0.1 to 0.5 one five for the solar absorptance. You can see a time it changed. And so the thermal properties of the satellite as a whole change. 
because of the Teflon uh, ref, uh, surface material used for thermal control. So thermal control can be thrown out of kilter for long-term exposure to the damaging effects of long-term dosage. Now, what is dosage? Dosage is basically the deposition of so many ergs of or joules of energy into a certain uh, mass of uh, material. It's like 100 ergs per gram uh, is one, uh, one rad, as it's called. And the, basically, you're heating up the material. Think of it as heat per unit mass, and that gives you what dose is. Now, come down to the left, you can see some, uh, some surfaces that were, were used for thermal control. That started out white that Tedlar down there. And after three or four years of exposure at GEO, you can see how it crinkles and runs up. It's really pretty much totally destroyed. Now in the middle there with the astronaut, that's the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the thermal control blankets. And because of exposure to the environment, they ripped and sort of began, or began, began to fall apart and had to be, you have to fix them when that happens. So you have substantial material damage. And as I said before, the camera back on the other end had uh, hundreds of micrometeoroid debris pits in it over the five year period. And below that are some test samples showing you what started out as white paint. And you can see how it turned black from uh, typical space exposures. So materials suffer uh, from ultraviolet EUV and from particle radiation. Um, it turns out that you have gigarads of radiation on the surface. Now, before you get frightened, uh, it is bad, but it's only in the first few microns. Uh, the particles deposit, uh, it, because the mass is so small on the, the, the layer you're talking about, a few microns layer, any energy you dump, uh, since G, the mass in grams is very small, and you put any energy up there, it's gonna get gigarads. The net result though, is that the very thin edges of things, they get severe uh, sheets of material and stuff can have uh, darkening and da serious damaging, whereas internal to the material is not as bad. So dimensions can change. Uh, tensile strength of uh, uh, materials over time can change. And the conductivity uh, can be uh, charged. You build up charge, you can change the um, uh, material of the device, actually. Uh, we find that lots of materials, if you're not careful, like glasses in particular, will become self-radiation radiation, uh, sources uh, because of the rare earths and stuff used in them. They can become um, stimulated. Transmission of glasses, reflectance of surface, and outright decomposition. And that's one of the things I haven't talked about here, but I should mention it, that contamination is a major problem for most satellites. Now, I'm sure on the interstellar probe missions and things like that, they're going to take great uh, care to make sure that things that without gas don't ex aren't on there. But outgassing, uh, exposure, things of that nature can be a real problem. And speaking of contamination, uh, there is an apocryphal story that one of the, that the, one of the voyagers was uh, being tested and somebody noticed that there were ants crawling on it. And uh, they used a little raid on those. And so somewhere out there, there's the Voyager spacecraft with dead ants. And when the aliens find it, they're gonna think that's us. And uh, they're gonna try to communicate with, back to us with ants. If you remember Star, the first Star Trek movie and the thing called Vager, which was Voyager, uh, well, they're gonna be looking for ants, not humans. So just remember that. Be careful what you leave on your spacecraft when, for aliens to find. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is the, one of the major environments that we have to concern ourselves with. That's the ambient radiation environment. Now, you may ask yourself, how do we measure it? Well, obviously, Voyage are out in space out there. That, uh, by the way, we measure energy in electron volts uh, for spacecraft for the radiation environment. So electron volt and EV is the unit, typical unit we use. MEV is millions of electron volts. And uh, down here, nucleon, we divide by the number of uh, protons or neutrons that are in an atom to get what the energy per nucleon is. That's per proton or per neutron. And that's one of the, the quantities that we use in uh, propagating 
the uh, space radiation particles through the spacecraft. So start in the middle one. The middle one's probably looks most complex, but it's actually the this, this simplest. Now, let me get this, let me read this off to you so I get it all right. As, as supernovas eject tremendous amounts of particles when they explode, uh, ionized particles, all the heavy elements, everything down to protons and helium atoms and electrons are ejected when you have a nuclear explosion. The net result of, of, of a nova, the net result of that is that these particles are coming out in millions of electron volts energy, actually up to what we call GeV, billions of electron volts energy. And I'll show you how high energy they go in just a second in the next slide. But the main thing to know is that these things are very energetic. Um, an MeV per nucleon uh, will penetrate uh, about, uh, an, about, let's see, what is it? A, a tenth of an inch into a material or farther for electrons. Uh, ions are typically stopped at the surface, but by the time you get up to GeV, they're penetrating um, fraction, a centimeter or more into a body. So you need typically centimeters of shielding on these things to keep the radiation down, as we'll see in the next slide. But continuing on here, uh, as these heavy ions pass through space, they bonk into things and they break apart. And at the end of the day, what we end up with is hydrogen, of course, helium. And then we have things called oxygen group and the iron group. Things break down, they tend to go to two, two basic species, uh, families of particles, those around oxygen at 16 and iron at 56, uh, to, wh where the nucleuses are fairly, are more stable. The other, most of the other types of species break down, but we, so we tend to measure things in terms of the hydrogen, helium, oxygen family, and the iron family of nucleides. And that's what's plotted here in the middle one. And this is, this is a very interesting plot and one that if you take nothing else from, you should probably uh, remember this one. If, we, if you look down at a um, 1,000 MeV per nucleon, or other words, a GeV, and look to the right, you'll see that all the curves overlie on each other. The highest, the highest flux, this is flux now, it's particles per square centimeter per second per stair radian per uh, MeV per nucleon. If you look over there on the, the, to the right, you can see the curves come together. What these are is the interstellar particles. They're so energetic that the magnetic field of the sun and the magnetic field of the earth where these measurements are being made do not deflect them. Remember, these are charged particles. And when a charged particle comes into a magnetic field, it's deflected and tries to, tries to turn. And here you can see the uh, effect of the uh, uh, lower energy particles. You can start to see those effects. At about uh, 100 to, let's see, 100 to 1,000 MeV per nucleon, you can see that there's a bump. That's where the, interstellar, where the interstellar population of, GS, of GCRs uh, dominates. To the left, you see it start to fall off. Those are the lower energy interstellar ones are, sh are shielded by the Earth's and solar magnetic fields. And so the thing starts to, sh the spectrum starts to fall off. But to the left, it starts to pick up again. That's because we're getting solar protons and heavy ions. These are from solar flares. So you basically are seeing three populations. To the left, you get into the uh, solar system. To in the middle there, you're getting it, you're, the ones that are being, uh, the interstellar ones that are being deflected and their flux reduced. And to the right, you have the ones that aren't. Now, why is there a dash, two dashed lines there? Well, the upper curved solid line is the interstellar spectrum is what we think it to be. Uh, under, unadulterated by any magnetic shielding effects. The dashed lines, the highest dashed line there is when the sun is at solar minimum. That's when this activity is, is submitted. During that time period, the galactic cosmic rays can come streaming in and are not as greatly affected by the sun's magnetic field. At solar maximum, when the solar flares are the highest and you have lots of solar proton events and stuff like that uh, going on, the solar wind magnetic field is very high and it will do uh, and turbulent 
and it will cause the, cause the uh, uh, GCRs to diffuse inward. And so there are not as many of them. So you have the top curve is what we see in interstellar space. The next curve down is what we see when the sun is quiet and we get very high radiation levels here at the earth. And then the bottom curve, uh, each, of those pair, uh, each of those four curves is when the sun is really active. So we can actually measure the interstellar environment. That's what the middle one is saying. Now, if you go to the right over there, that's what the, the same thing for the galactic cosmic ray electrons. Now the cos cosmic ray electrons have much lower fluxes than the, um, uh, than the, one, uh, the protons in general because the uh, electrons are deflected substantially by the uh, scattering of the ambient medium and by the magnetic fields and things like that. So on the right, you have what the uh, flux of uh, electrons would be, okay? And you get the idea, you can see that the 1AU is sub they're substantially uh, down from what you would see in interstellar space. Um, on the left up here, this is the, from the latest Voyager observations. And what you're seeing up on the left there is the so-called helios sheath spectrum. This is the spectrum we see as we move out from the solar system. Uh, that, remember again, the solar systems, the solar min, solar max spectrum. And as we go through the uh, magnetic field of the sun where it interacts with the interstellar magnetic field. And the, these are, let me see if I can explain these to you because they, they're fairly, uh, uh, confusing to be frank, <laughs> but they are. The first one is the thermal shock particles, TSP. These are particles that are accelerated and, gain, and, and energized by the shock between wave between the sun, heliosphere, and the interstellar medium. Those are to the left over there. That's the energy range where you see them. And then in the middle, you see the, the spectrum for the uh, anomalous cosmic rays. These are very, we're not quite sure to this day what they are, but apparently what happens is the charged particles in, this, in the galactic cosmic ray charge exchange and with these and knock on with the particles, the low energy plasma and particles and stuff that are in the helios sheath. And these particles are accelerated and they come bombing in but they are, still have all their electrons. The GCR typically are stripped of all their electrons and because of bouncing through the, going through the uh, interstellar medium for, thousands, for millions of years, they slowly get their electrons stripped off. And these things, the anomalous cosmic rays have a lot of electrons on them. And as a result of that, they're not nearly as uh, affected by the, su the sun's magnetic field as they come in. And so they, they also show a substantial variation with solar cycle. And they're called the anomalous component of the galactic cosmic rays. And we think that's because they're not as heavily ionized in their charge exchange or some process with the uh, exterior galactic cosmic rays. And then you have the background galactic cosmic rays shown there, which we talk about on the middle. So those are the environments that we see from the, uh, env from the space environment for the uh, radiation environment. Can we go to the next slide, please? This on the left is the whole shebang for the galactic cosmic rays. And you can see it goes from uh, 10 to the minus nine, uh, let's see, uh, 10 to the minus nine over here up to 10 to the 21st electron volts. That's a tremendous amount of energy. We actually measure cosmic rays with that energy on the surface of the earth. What's ha if I remember what way they do it is the cosmic ray comes in as one little bitty particle hits the atmosphere and generates Cherenkov radiation, which is called stopping radiation and causes a shower of other particles. And from that, they work backwards to what the energy of the incoming particle is. And it turns out that this one little particle um, was, think of it as one nucleon, one nucleus, had the energy of a baseball going 60 miles per hour for that's one little particle and that's up there around 10 to the 21st but you can see here all the different regions and stuff i'm not going to go into those today but that's the, the complete ambient uh, uh, distribution of charged particles in this interplanetary space environment 
On the right, you can see the uh, what we call what we've estimated to be for a 20 year mission, what we think to be the total dose as a function of aluminum shielding. Uh, that's if you assume the aluminum sphere around your spacecraft, and that would be the thickness in mils of aluminum. Now, a mil is a thousandth of an inch, so a thousand mils is one inch. And so you're looking at, uh, typically you're looking at a hundred mils, which is about a tenth of an inch of shielding on most spacecraft. For some reason in the radiation community, we still talk in terms of mils. Forgive me, but we, it's like furlongs per fortnight. We're still back in the dark ages, but that's what we use. And you can see on the left, you can see what the dose is. Now, let me tell you, let me give you an example. Uh, a dose of about um, uh, 100 uh, rads will make you sick. A dose of 500 rads will make you die within a couple of days. Uh, electronic parts, uh, typically the most sensitive ones uh, fail at about a couple of thousand rads. That's a so-called killer rad. That would be 10 to the third over there. And by the 10 to the fourth rads is the typical shielding level require the hardness level requirement for electronic microelectronic parts that we use for our missions. So 10 to the fourth is normal and 10 to the fifth and, and above, we have parts higher than 10 to the sixth threads, by the way, uh, obviously for nuclear weapons effects. Uh, we, we do have parts that are designed to withstand nuclear weapon environments, obviously, and uh, they're purchasable, they're extremely expensive, but we've considered them and used them on some of our spacecraft. Uh, so let's assume our spacecraft has at least an, around an inch, uh, tenths of an inch to an inch, you can see that there are part of the electronic parts from a dose standpoint, there are probably a lot of parts that we can buy. The problem we have these days, and I wanna stress this right now, is what we call plastic or commercial parts. Um, the car, automobile industry, people like that, uh, buying thousands of little computer chips and things of that nature, and they, and they have these massive buys. So the electronics, microelectronics industry is designed to fulfill their needs. To build parts up to a mega rad or even, even above 10 to the fifth rad parts, you have to do a lot of testing certification and you have to have very uh, careful uh, lot develop. When you build a lot of parts, you have to uh, uh, set of parts. You have to certify it very carefully. You have to follow every step. You have to record it and make sure that those parts are hardened to those levels and you, then you have to take the parts and test about half of them to make sure they're that hard so the other half are presumably the same. That costs a lot of money. And so we're really down to only one or two, one or two manufacturers that will actually make us parts in these radiation ranges. So if you can use commercial parts down around a kilorad or less, that's great. The problem we also have is that typically those parts haven't been tested. So one of the big things we do at JPL in my group is we test micro, microelectronic parts to destruction using radiation and we characterize those parts. And that's a very expensive process. That's, that's why, for example, they talk about the $100 toilet seats where we have the $10,000 uh, $2 part. We have to test them. So please remember that when you get into interstellar space or anything actually that requires reliability in space. Testing is an extremely, for reliability, is an extremely uh, important issue. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is the problem that uh, I, I, I'm very uh, queasy about because we don't really have that great a knowledge yet. Look at it this way. What we do is we look out, we look out from the Earth out into space. And as we look out there, we can see dimming of starlight. We know what the star's brightness should be, and we know that it's not that bright. So we can make an estimate uh, of the gas and the dust between us and there. And we can look out in all different directions and try to, and try to build a model of the gas and dust in each direction. You can think of the... Uh, uh, pillars of life. You remember you know, the fingers that go up and stuff. That's all dust and uh, uh, gas particles coming off those uh, 
coming off of those uh, stars out there. I'm gonna have to shut the door that somebody's decided to run their yard implement. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, if you look on the left, uh, these are from the 1978 from the Daedalus study. The Inter British Interplanetary Society did a very famous study uh, where they tried to come up with a practical design for uh, interstellar mission. And I, re I re recommend that you take a very careful look over that because they looked at everything, very thorough, uh, many volumes on it. And to this day, they're continuing to update and work on that mission. As you know, we now have the uh, Breakthrough Starshot uh, program going on. The, uh, there are a number of similar studies going on uh, for doing these kind of things. And so those are just two of the, two of the ones that I know of. And you, anyway, for that program, they made estimates of what the, inners, of the clouds should be like in space or the inner cloud regions or in the solar neighborhood. Now, what you see there is the first chart gives you the number of particles uh, per cubic meter. And you can see it's fairly hefty number in the solar, even in the solar neighborhood, it's around 10 to the six supposedly. And we go down and you can see what the density of the gas is. That's how many kilograms per cubic meter um, one of these little particles weighs. So what you have to do now is you have to integrate along a 20 light year trajectory, you have to integrate along that trajectory to get the total number of impacts you're gonna get in a per square meter per square centimeter, uh, how many number of hits you're going to get. And then you have to multiply by the velocity you're going at to get you know, one, one half mv squared, one half the mass times the velocity squared uh, will give you what the, the interaction um, energy is going to be between each one of these particle hits and how many of them you're going to get. And it works out as a lot. And you're going to, these particles are going to, even the gas particles are going to knock off atoms on your uh, device. Uh, if you come down to the next thing, you can see what the, the dust particles look like. The upper was the gas. Now we're going to look at the dust particles. And again, it's not that well known, at least from between here and Alpha Centauri. That's the problem. You can see the range here, uh, upwards of two or three orders of magnitude, uh, for even for the dust particles. And you can see what the mean mass of a dust grain is. It's about a thousand protons or so. Uh, particles in one of, these little particle, one of these little dust particles, atoms. And so you can see there's gas and there's dust that you're going to have to go through. And you're going to have to integrate it over 20 light years and at a velocity of two tenths the speed of light. That's a lot, that's a heck of a velocity. One proton, if I estimated it right, is about a hundred million electron volts in energy when it hits you. So it's up there in the range of the cosmic rays when these things are hitting. And so those have to be added in. And there have been several, a number of studies, a very recent one that a lot of people quote, is this one down here by Hong et al., the interaction of the relativistic spacecraft with the interstellar medium. This was done for the break sh breakthrough star shot. And I would suggest that you refer to that article. Uh, you've got the reference here. If you wanna see what some of the latest thinking on that is. Now, in the original, uh, Daedalus study, they came up with a value, if you look under there, of about uh, one millimeter of aluminum uh, per square, one millimeter of aluminum would be eroded uh, in the, on the surface in which you're moving towards, you know, the one that's being impacted. So one millimeter of aluminum. If you look down here at the, uh, star, the star shot estimates, again, they come up with about one millimeter. The problem is if you go back up to the previous ch uh, uh, chart up there, you can see that it could be another order of magnitude more of it. And then you're starting to talk about centimeters of erosion. And so that the problem is the uncertainty. We, we need to measure this, we need a, a, a inter, in a clean mission, like a thousand astronauts to go out there and measure this stuff if we're going to design something that's going to last for 20 something years to get out there. So think about at least a millimeter to three millimeters or so of uh, 
just of surface being eroded and all the energy that that uh, will generate the heating of your spacecraft things of that nature and basically banging you around and although the calculations that they ran seem to indicate that it's not going to do too much to your alignment but um, it, it's going to be an issue now can we have the next slide please Okay, we've been gone for going for about uh, 30 minutes. It looks like we've been going for what, about uh, almost an hour? Is that about right? I think that's right. So here we go. This gives you an idea of what the uh, interplanetary meteoroid flux looks like. Now, what I mean by meteoroids, meteoroids start down around 10 to the minus 20 grams, uh, 10 to minus 6, I should say 10 to minus 16th grams where the dust particles are. And this is the stuff that's not dust. This is the chunks. And believe it or not, what you see here are two curves. The upper curve is what we actually measure at the Earth, uh, hitting the Earth. And we know that that's basically the ambient micrometeoroid flux as a function of mass. And this time it's in kilograms. And that's number of particles hitting you per square meter per second. And uh, it's pretty damaging, but uh, it, and that's what you see on the Hubble, things like that. Now, the red line is what's actually coming from interstellar space. And that, uh, part, that particle environment is the reason we can see it and identify it is because those particles are typically moving in excess of 70 kilometers per second. And that means that they can escape from the solar system. So if you're getting hit by something that's 70 kilometers per second, you know it ain't coming locally. It's coming from uh, interstellar space. And so what you see there, that red line, that's the interstellar space environment of micrometeoroids. That's the chunks that they hit you, they're gonna ruin your whole day. And for example, a 10 to the minus 10th uh, kilogram particle, that would be, uh, 10 to the minus uh, seven grams, uh, in other words, we're 10 microgram, uh, 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 microgram particle, which we start, we can actually start to measure them on impacts at Earth, um, is going to be about one impact per square meter in 20 years. So what's the solution? Make your spacecraft really long and really long and thin, and <laughs> like a needle, and fly it like a needle, which is what I think the uh, Starshot people are planning to do. But the bottom line is that we actually have information on that environment, and it's it's incredible to me that we can measure the interstellar meteoroid environment and see it here. And if you remember that big one that came by Umami or um, however you pronounce it. Uh, there's this, another one that just came through. Two, there have been two interstellar uh, comets, co uh, asteroids come by the Earth. Now on the right there, you can see a little cartoon. And I think you all know the story of Chicken Little who ran around saying the sky is falling. And well, by golly, it did. And people do get hit with meteorites. So it's not too far out. So if we get hit by a gram-sized particle on interstellar flight, it's all over with. So one answer to that is fly lots of little ones and uh, so that they, so some of them will get through. Next slide, please. Let's see, we're, go we're off at uh, 11.30, I believe. So we've got about 10 minutes to go and we're getting to the end. Okay, so what are the reliability concerns based on all this that I've talked to you about? They're unique to interstellar missions. First of all, advanced attitude control systems or beam riders for the star shot. That's to keep them for both the laser and for keeping the signal back to the earth. Ultra high levels of autonomy, uh, upwards of 20 to 40 years of command uh, turnaround uh, for control health. You're not got, it's gotta be autonomous. You just can't do anything with it. The ability to self repair, uh, system redundancy and fault tolerance. Finally, careful consideration of flight sparing versus functional redundancy. Now, what I mean here is you can have six of six radio transmitters, all exactly the same. You turn one on, it dies, you turn the next one on. And 
problem is that if radiation damage is what kills the first one, there's a good chance all the others are gonna die at the same time, depending on uh, their, how they respond to radiation. So one of the things you can do, and we did this on Galileo, is we had different transmission systems. We had different antennas. And as a result of that, we were able to shift from the main antenna that we lost to one of the backup omnidirectional antennas to get the data back. So that's called functional redundancy as opposed to uh, uh, system redundancy. The next thing is careful consideration of flights, uh, sorry, robot capable of in-flight repair. If you have a larger satellite, perhaps you can have little robots, nanobots or something that travels around your vehicle and repairs things. And uh, that would be the ultimate integrated health and management system, obviously. Or you can have people if you're going on a, an interstellar travel. Development of common replacement part strategy. A uh, thing called uh, uh, field programmable gate arrays, for example. You can have, you have millions of these little uh, devices on there and you can burn uh, or you can reconfigure the, the computer system to do different things, turn it from a radio to a computer to things like that by programming it. You can actually program the, uh, the bits to do different things. So that's one way to do it. You can, uh, act meet, you can actively regenerate key systems in flight that way. Advanced techniques for reconfiguring and reprogramming, the same thing. And the new sits, one thing is there are people uh, looking at the mechanical systems of that nature that will run tens of thousands of years. There's this long now foundation building a clock that's supposed to span 50 years. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. Well, to summarize, uh, here are the key concerns. We've already reached interstellar space, 43 year missions of the Voyagers. Propulsions 10 to 20% may be possible with current technologies though, it might take a huge amount of investment. The major natural envir major environment is probably the dust and the meteoroid impacts. We'll need to rethink our current maintainability procedures in light of 50 year missions and autonomous operations. This either proliferation, many small probes are need to develop probes that can repair themselves in flight. Then we need the development of common replacement part strategy. And finally, we need to be able to address the issue. There was a uh, recent uh, article, I think an AIAA aerospace thing on how you manage a program for 50 years. And that's just a real problem. How do you keep the management? Can I have the next slide, please? These are some references for you. I'm not gonna go over those. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is my YouTube. I have a YouTube video if you want to watch it uh, for about an hour or so that goes, I did for Goddard Space Flight Center that goes through all these environments. And it, you have to wait about 10 minutes for it to get started. Final view graph, final view graph, next view graph, next view graph. Whoops. Can you hear me? Yes, is this the one? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hell. There we go. Yep, this is it. This is the true purpose of interstellar travel. <laughs> now, can, let's, can we take a couple minute break and I'll answer questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay? Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, anyone, any question? You, you can raise hand, you can uh, speak out. Uh, I think, Mr. Um, Jonathan Connor has some comments, uh, so you're welcome to speak out if you like. If you can hear me, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Jonathan, go ahead. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. You cannot hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. All right. All right. So anybody have a question? Yeah, I think Jonathan wants to say something. 
Jonathan, can you go ahead? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm trying to get Jonathan to speak out and then he tried to say something, but uh... I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. This is Tom Spilker. Am I live? Yes. Uh, you, you, welcome to speak out. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to uh, uh, back up one of the things that uh, Hank said, uh, talking about his experience as a, uh, a high schooler doing a science fair and how the, the subject that he treated there wound up being a part of his career. Uh, I just wanted to say I, my experience has been that things that are just seemingly impossible to connect with your career uh, in any way can sometimes wind up being part of your career. And the example I was giving was that uh, in, my, in my past, I was a skydiver. I, I've gone out the door of airplanes many times, often using a parafoil parachute. Uh, and as it turns out, while I was at JPL, because I had experience with the parafoil, it became one of my jobs with the Genesis mission to help fix the parafoil parachute that they were using for the recovery device for that mission. So it was something that never in a million years would I have thought this would become part of my career, actually became part of my career. So people should not try to compartmentalize their lives too much because you never know what kind of experience is going to become part of your career? Mm -hmm. Okay, do I have, uh, any, I don't see any questions. Was was the talk that good or was it everybody go leave? <laughs> well, yeah. Henry, there was one, uh, one thing that somebody put up, uh, a question about could you please post the uh, URL or the, or the link for that YouTube uh, video on the uh, question and answer site. Uh, some other people may be having the same problem I'm having. I could only see the rightmost about 60% of your slides. I don't know if it's my browser or whatever, but I couldn't see the entire slide. And when that slide with your YouTube uh, link came up, I couldn't see the whole link, so it might be really useful to uh, put that link into both the chat and the uh, question and answers. All right, uh, let me see if I can uh, do it. I'm not sure how. To, I'm not quite sure how to do it, but I'll try. Uh, I know I have to get it, so I, it's it, you have to copy it. Let me see. Uh, can you go? Can you go back to it uh, to the thing? Let me see. It's, it's, it's real long. I'm trying to get it. Let me think. How do you find it? Um, I know. It was the last. It, it oh, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Gary, I can post it. I, I got it from your slide. I can post it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. So you can post it from the slide? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, copy it now. Great, thank you. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Gary, I think uh, Jonathan has some question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. I just did. Uh, Rec Voyager 2 was lost first, trajectory all right. Jim, thanks a lot. Welcome to speak out your question. Hope you can comment on what might have been the cause whoops, of the failure of the NASA shuttle tether experiment. Or yes, we, I know what the cause of the shuttle tether experiment was. The uh, tethers, it w went out about, I think it's supposed to go out 100 kilometers, and it went out about 10 kilometers, and the astronaut was looking out the back window uh, following it as it went out. Do you know how uh, you have on a fishing rod, you have the little ring that the, that the uh, uh, cord goes through? Well, it turns out that they had wound the... Uh, tether up. So when they were winding it up, there was a piece of metal braid in the uh, coil. And when they 
the stress of winding it up pushed the metal braid through the insulation and created a little light, a little lightning point, an uh, arcing point. And as that point came by this, the ring, the, 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 the grommet that allows the plane to go out, it threw about a six inch arc to the spacecraft. Because at that point it had about a thousand volts differential potential between because of the V cross B effect, the rinse force, because of the V cross B effect through a six inch arc, melted the uh, tether, went flying off, scared the bejeebers out of NASA because they had about a 10 kilometer long wire and a, and a shuttle there. And they got the heck out of there and they haven't launched a tether since. <laughs> so that answers that question. And uh, let's see, how do SUFX tiny geometry FPGA fly in? FPGAs have a problem and that's something that we're very carefully investigating at JPL because uh, you can you can fry an individual little cell if you're not careful and then you can get a uh, uh, latch up which is a problem so one of the things we can do there is monitor the you can burn FPGAs or you can keep them alive you, know, you can make an ASIC where they've actually hardwired them but if you leave them alive, you can go in and rewire around them in principle if you have a problem. But uh, no, FPGAs can be seriously damaged as far as I'm aware. Okay, and how does you affect, okay. And it's a tiny geometry that's a problem. And it's because you've got a lot of them packed in and you can take out more than one at a time if you're not careful. Is there some kind of trap band of radiation? Yes, um, at 25,000 feet, no. Uh, that's what uh, five miles. No, there's not one there. There is one at 25,000 kilometers, and that, that's neo environment. There's there's an inner radiation belt, and that goes from like about three or four thousand kilometers up to about uh, 20. If I'm, I'm, I should I do know I just not remember it instantly about 20,000 kilometers, then about 30,000 kilometers up you get into the outer radiation belt. So I think if you uh, Hank, yeah, uh, one of the things that they might be referring to with the twenty five thousand feet is it's not so much radiation, but oh, there is a Foster maximum. It's called the Foster maximum, and what you're talking about there is that the cosmic rays as they come into the atmosphere, the uh, maximum ionization level in the atmosphere occurs at twenty five thousand feet, where the cosmic rays deposit a uh, a band is not trapped. The trap bands what is the radiation, right. bands. but there is a region that the early cosmic ray people discovered called the Fotzer maximum, and that's as charged particles come in, they break up, and as they break up, they break up many fine pieces, and that causes a shower. But then the shower is absorbed, and the maximum of that shower is at twenty-five thousand feet, which happens to be precisely the alt equivalent altitude on Mars at the surface. So the Fotzer maximum on Mars is at the surface for the same reason. Yeah, there's another phenomenon that happens as you get to higher altitudes, and we see this with launch vehicles sometimes. I know there have been some launch vehicle failures because of this. Uh, when you're down at the ground, there's a fair amount of water and the atmospheric density is high. And so you, you tend to get discharge of things that are building up charges especially with a lot of water around. So you, you can't build up too much of a potential because of that discharge. But as you get to higher altitudes, you lose the water and you lose the density of the atmosphere around you. And you can build up charges to, to higher voltage levels, higher potentials, and essentially generate a, a, a discharge. Um, I remember this must have been about 15 or 20 years ago, one of the first tests of a, a new launch vehicle failed because of such a discharge. Uh, to add to that, if you, I don't know if you caught our first uh, discussions here, but I brought up precisely that point <laughs> with the next speaker, because uh, Martin Newman, the uh, lightning expert at Florida, called me up and I tracked down for him all the articles on precisely that effect, that the launch vehicles built up static charge as they go, as they go up, and it's a problem too. But uh, it's not interstellar. <laughs> that, that's a, that's right. <laughs> and let's see. 
Hence, how much are modern high performance small geometry modern electronics at risk for airliners, jets, et cetera? They're, they're got a problem. And we have taken part in se uh, several studies where we fly the, uh, sensors on um, high altitude aircraft to measure the effects of cosmic rays on the people and on devices. And um, uh, th we've actually published a number of papers on that environment. And it's a problem. And they had problems here on the ground in the early days. I'm not sure. I, I'm trying to, was it Wang or somebody? That one of the system people that built the uh, uh, large uh, computer systems, routers and things, ha had all kinds of problems because they were getting single event upsets on the ground. And they had to go to the, the redundancy techniques and stuff that I talked about, the EDAC software. They had to go to those techniques to, uh, to uh, get around that problem. Uh, you can't just use memory. You have to use memory uh, where you check each data point and things of that nature. Any more questions? Hey folks, if any question, you are welcome to uh, type in Q&A box, chat room, or raise your hand to speak out. You can call, you, uh, I th do you give them my phone number? I mean, I can. Oh, okay. I'll, 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 I'll tell them. I just, my wife said not to. <laughs> uh, yeah, better email. for privacy. Yeah. Do email. And anyway, it's uh, my email. You can use the uh, APL account. Henry A. Period B is a boy. Period Garrett G A R R E T T at JPL dot NASA dot gov, and I'd be glad to answer any question. By the way, how many people did we have? Do you know? Uh, I, yeah, right now because in transition, so uh, I think it's like a, a, a 40, 50 people, um, forty, around forty people doing the your talk. Okay, so I guess that I think we've got our time is up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost, yes. Hank, Linda said to tell you a big hello. Oh, so Linda's there. <laughs> okay. Hi, Linda. <laughs> She's the one that had the fun mission. <laughs> well, she and I were both uh, Voyager. Uh, well, that's even she, better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw that there was somebody else. Uh, uh, James, uh, somebody here was talking about they were on Voyager. We, we've probably got several Voyager uh, veterans here. Well, I think Voyager is really the, the epitome of this. And uh, it's great to see that it's still going and making very important measurements. Um, it's, it's sad that we've come to the point of being able to launch a, a Tau mission or things like that. and. They always back off. There's, there's, I'm glad to see Starshot star Breakthrough. Breakthrough Starshot is actually trying to do it. And uh, I envy my friend Pete Warden <laughs> being yep. that, having that. So that it. I guess we can sign. Ken, are you ready to, for me to sign off? OK, yeah. So if you have any uh, uh, comments, uh, you're welcome to if you want to say something to conclude. Well, I guess the first thing is, did, did anybody hear me? Was, was the sound all right? <laughs> yeah, the sound was all right. I don't know why uh, Dr. Spilker, but the, the slide seems to be all right because I'm opening another device. It seems to be okay. Well, I think what it is, he may have had the chat on or had the- uh, Oh yeah, that's right. You can I, have... think it's, I think it's my old browser. Oh, sorry for that. Yeah. Because you can have you can have the people across the top down the side, and you can uh, or the ch the chat takes up the whole side. Yeah, I made sure that chat and and all of that was was off. It's just that the in my browser the slide was displaced to the left, so I could only see about sixty percent of it. Yeah, Doctor Spilker, actually, this uh, session, uh, uh, Doctor Care has uh, gave us permission, so you it is recorded and it will be posted and the link will be provided to you and the attendees. Excellent, right. thank you. Well, thank you, and I, I want to sign off, and I want to s close, uh, not with Ad Astra, which I believe in, <laughs> but uh, I would like to say that I'm glad you people were able to take the time today to listen to this, and I'd be glad to help in the future in any way. Uh, I get all kinds of crazy requests. I did the calculations for Ed Stone 
for the uh, movie, that TV series on what happens when people die, on how long it takes for the record to decay from micrometeoroid impacts. <laughs> it's a billion years. <laughs> anyway, it worked out. <laughs> we calculated how long it takes for the, for the dust to destroy the record on Voyager. So I guess that's it. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really amazing and fantastic. So uh, stay in touch. Uh, hopefully we uh, get another chance uh, to uh, have you back with us and uh, uh, when, uh, whenever you like. Okay, I got I got a two-day course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we'll tell people about it, yes. It's recorded. JPL's got it recorded. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much again, Dr. Garrett. This is fantastic. Uh, highly uh, uh, thrilled and honored. Really appreciate it.